Hello YouTube, this is the Gentleman Scholar, and um, just want to say hello, it's been a little while before I, since I checked in. Keep it going. Housekeeping. This nice pear wood pipe made for me by Johan, the Mindful Piper and my go-to Norman Rockwell portrait. It's the, it's the tin that seems to have emptied out the quickish, so. Keep it going. I'm gonna get my geek on today, which means talking about superheroes and a certain movie that just came out. So if that's not your thing, this is your stop. I just, just wanted to warn you now in case you wanted to get off early. So, Dr. Stephen Strange, Master of the Mystic Arts. Yes, I love the character enough to have several action figures of him, plus a bust upstairs, which uh, the painter sort of cracked the tip of his cape here because it's made, you know, it's made out of ceramic. Do you want to bring that down? Anyway, went to go see the movie on Friday. I dragged my husband with me. It was everything I expected a full-on Doctor Strange film to be. Um, it had this creepy, and this creepy, strange, otherworldly vibe. It was packed with psychedelic, mind-melting images. All in the service of a good story, of course. I'm trying not to do any spoilers here. And smokes really well, Johan. Thank you very much again. Um, and if you ever read Doctor Strange, or you realize that he's not exactly your normal superhero book. I brought an example. Turning to any page. And you can see how trippy the graphics are. I can't talk about typing that off yet. There you one. Basically, um, when I was a kid and I saw, like, Doctor Strange on the cover, it just looked freaking weird, freaking, just freaky. You know, it's just like, you had tentacles coming out of portals in thin air type of thing, surreal, surreal dreamscapes. It was just freaking odd. This wasn't Spider-Man swimming, you know, swinging across the sky, not, skyline of New York City. And it kind of freaked me out a little bit. And I remember my mom, I'm going to ash this here. I don't know if you've ever been to those stores like, you know, Zares or, the, you know, like Zares or Kmart. They used to sell those uh, comics in three packs. And one of them had a Doctor Strange. And it looked, it had an image just like that. My mom goes, no, no, I don't want you to buy that. You're, that's too strange. That's too weird. So obviously the imagery hit her like it hit me. But then once upon a time, I went and discovered at my local library a few years later, they were doing a... Um, a Doctor Strange, you know, there was a Doctor Strange graphic novel, much like that one there. It, it dealt with his origin, how he came to be the way he was, etc., so on. Done by the great Stan Lee and Steve Ditko, of course. Now, the, the images back then were already freaky. It's like, I want to say 63, 64. You, you know, he's high on the success of creating the Fantastic Four. The Hulk. Come on. Excuse me. Iron Man, the Avengers, the whole thing. So 
in Strange Tales, I forget the exact issue number, he came up with Doctor Strange, he's a mystical practitioner who helped people out with their supernatural problems. I don't even think he had a cape. If he had a cape, it was a blue one. Anyway, um, his first case was uh, protecting a man from entering his dreams to protect him from nightmare. That's one of um, Doctor Strange's main enemy. Surprised he hasn't shown up yet, to be quite honest. As this particular um, movie dealt a lot with dreams. I love Norman Rockwell Portrait. Anyway, saw it, loved it. Sam Raimi, who um, he's directed the Evil Dead movies along with the first three original Spider-Man movies with Tobey Maguire. He really was able to let his horror pedigree rip loose. There's some callbacks to the Evil Dead movies in there. Which, if you're a fan of those movies, you'll be able to recognize. Keep it going. Ash the pipe out. Um, especially with Shuma Garat, that big gigantic type, that, that gi big di gigantic demon with tentacles and an eyeball at the center. What happens with that eyeball is a very... To uh, Evil Dead 2, Dead by Dawn. But I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the hell out of it. If I could have gotten away with seeing it again right then and there, I would have. But, you know, I had things to do. Probably go again next week or so. But it's very true to the character. Uh, if you've been following the Marvel storyline, or most of it, ever since the first Iron Man movie back 14 years ago, if you can believe that, then there's a lot of payoffs in it. Um, if you want more of a... If you want more of a context for seeing it, you have to see the What If... The What If series... Featuring Doctor Strange, where he comes up, where we feature a less morally ethical Doctor Strange, and what he does, you get to meet him again in this movie. And also, you might want to see WandaVision, because Wanda appears in this movie, and uh, what took place in WandaVision plays very heavily into the decisions that she makes in this particular movie. Talking too much, not enough pupping. But I really enjoyed it. I was like a kid again watching it. And, um, and it just it didn't compromise on the weirdness. Um, I mean, you've got Gonzo stuff, Gonzo weirdness stuff, like him possessing the body of one of his dead counterparts from another universe. And of course, technically, you're not allowed to do that, so we get a lot of uh, reaction against that. It's just, oh man, all these really trippy ideas and uh, Gonzo imagery. Whoever did this movie, well, Sam Raimi. Whoever, everyone involved in this movie did their homework and it was excellent and I can't wait to see it again. Note about Doctor Strange is, you know, when college students and future, pardon, and future Marvel writers and everything else were reading that book in the 60s, I don't think like Stan Lee and Steve Ditko um, indulged in any recreational pharmaceutical substances like LSD or anything. But I'm for sure the people reading it in the colleges back in the 60s, they certainly did. They were certainly smoking some pot and doing whatever else. And by the time they got to Marvel, they had they added that sensibility to Doctor Strange where, you know, the visuals, as you saw, looked trippier, murkier. Uh, they were, the writers were included, Steve Englehart was including, like, you know, Lovecraftian themes in it and just freaking eyeballs and freaking demonic looking creatures that just they don't they're not friendly to look at so Doctor Strange just kind of takes a little while to get used to especially if you're a virgin if you're not if you're new to it but the movies are doing a good job of bringing you in and um lest I bore you with that I went to I was reading this the other day the ultimates hold on I'll show you the cover now once upon a time uh back in right around the turn of the century this past century the year 2000 Marvel wanted to reintroduce new readers to their characters, but if you have 40 years of back history, at that time it was like 40, 50 years of back history, no one wants to know, no one wants to, you, you feel intimidated by all that backstory that you have to get to know what's been happening for 40 years, I have to catch up. They didn't. They started with Ultimate Spider-Man, written by Brian Michael Bendis, and uh, 
was Ed, not Ed Begley Jr., but um, Mark Bagley Jr., Mark Bagley, did the, pet, did the art for it. It was excellent. It took Peter Wright to day one, sort of like the Spider-Man homecoming movie. When he's, like, he's in high school, you meet his geeky friends, and of course, they took you right into the ground floor there, and they retweaked the origin a little bit, and it was a great seller. So Marvel figures, hey, let's do it again with the Avengers, except this time they called them the Ultimates. And if you read this, um, it's very easily a template for what's coming up with the MCU that's going to be made in 10 years' time from this. Now, it's, all the ideas are there. I mean, you could tell they lifted ideas wholesale from this to do the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But there's a couple things in here that really kind of I found intriguing. Like there's this one scene right here where, let's see, right there, where... Colonel Fury is talking. He mentions Robert Downey Jr. And of course, back when this book was written, Robert Downey Jr. was uh, still a bon vivant. He was getting arrested for, uh, arrested for, you know, drug use, for, you know, drug possession and partying hardy. He was a burnout. And then he turns his life around like uh, 10 plus years later to play Iron Man. I thought that was kind of cool. A, a case of art imitating life, imitating art, but even better. And this is almost like them saying, hey, if you want the job, you can have it. Right down here, Colonel Fury is, they're talking about who would play him in the Marvel Universe. And of course, he mentions Sam Jackson, Sam, the great Samuel L. Jackson. And I think that when they did this book, as, you know, originally Nick Fury was white in the original Marvel Universe. He was the cigar-chomping, cigar-chomping World War II vet who, you know, kicked Nazi ass in the European theater of World War II. And, uh, so they updated him to be a very, very uh, shaft-like black guy, and it works. And of course, I think that they were saying, hey, uh, Sam Jackson, if we ever do a Marvel thing, feel like hooking up. And I've, as we know, he has, because he's all over the place in every single key Marvel movie you're ever going to watch. So I just thought that was an interesting meta take on art imitating life, imitating art. Yes, I'm a geek. No, I don't apologize for it. So I just... Um, to get on and talk about that because that's what turns me on. I hope you're all well. I hope things are going good. I um, wanted to mention, for no particular reason, I had this dream a couple nights ago. I would, it's not really a nightmare, but it's very discomforting. It's like about my job. Every time I dream about my job, it always involves reliability. It, like, do I have enough time? Because it's all about you have to sign in at a certain time, otherwise, it's a no show. And the plane can't go on time. So reliability is a big thing. And if you screw up with reliability, uh, you'll find yourself quickly fired. No problem. And you can't blame them. There's no lawyer can go to. There's no case you can plead. Because if you're unreliable, you forget about being a flight attendant. Um, more so than your, you know, I would say more so than your average regular jobs. If you show up for late at work, at, you know, working at the office or something, you can... You can coast by that for a while, but it won't last. It'll last a lot longer than if I try to coast by on that stuff. As a flight attendant, I imagine with pilots, he's even more so. But yeah, every time I have a dream like that, it's always mazes of corridors inside of, a, inside of an airport. I'm looking for the right gate to get to. I'm not sure if I'm signed in or not. And, or I'm alone in, a, alone in a cabin, a packed international flight, and I have to do the meal service all by myself or with just one other person. It's always something like that. So, but normally it's about reliability. I'm always, I'm like, oh my God, am I going to get there in time? I'm going to get there in time. Um, so yeah, I guess they've really done a number in programming me. But anyway, that was it. I just wanted to say hello. I'm sorry this is running a little long. Um, if you're interested in this, just see it in little bites. I hope you saw it in little bites. If you don't have the time to one sitting to do it, always, always a pleasure to see you folks in the YTPC. We'll speak to you again soon.